and we are thrilled to bring a rarity to you on this latest installment, Paul Varlins, the polar bear. We've reached out to Alaska and we found that cornerstone of early era UFC, Vali Tudo in Brazil, Kiev fights against Igor Vovchanchin and the rest. You know Paul, Paul Varlins as a combatant on the other side of some of the formative fights in this sport as we figured out what this whole mixed martial arts thing was going to look like. Paul Varlins was in there with a singlet, sometimes with a cutoff t-shirt, ready to figure it out himself under the bright lights. And we found him. Paul Varlins is joining us here on the sit-down. We are thrilled to have you, Paul. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm making my reappearance. So, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I guess I kind of am a rarity. <laughs> Let's start by talking about that. You, you suddenly emerged again. Um, you were on the, mo the roster of folks appearing on International Fight Week in Las Vegas as a UFC veteran. Why are you suddenly sort of back on the scene? You're on Twitter and stuff. What led to you kind of poking your head back out on, to the surface? Well, it has a lot to do with um, a gentleman named Brian Moore who has an organization. He started with, with Gary Goodrich called uh, Legends of the Cage. Um, and it's basically an organization that is... Uh, it, it reaches out and, and, and to help um, the old school fighters, or you know, even new new school fighters, any, any fighters that need help. Um, its its main focus is to get back the fighters that were from the from the golden age or the, the beginning of it, and to put together events that can connect the fans with the uh, with the old school guys and new school. You know, I mean, it's, it's it's pretty wide open, but really, Brian and Gary are both about helping people out and, and helping people with maybe challenging situations, help them through it and give them a good foundation. And it's, there's great guys. And it's, it's a great organization. Uh, look them up on, uh, on Twitter and, and Facebook. It's uh, Legends of the Cage. And I think it's uh, T-L-O-C MMA on Twitter. I'm bad with remember that. I'm sorry. But sure, yeah, sure. Up. No, we... It's good stuff. Certainly folks will be able to find it. So it's sort of a deal, Paul, where fans of the early era UFCs and early era uh, no holes barred events can, can come out and meet fighters from that era, get autographs, pictures, that kind of thing? Absolutely, absolutely. There's an event coming up in Syracuse. Uh, it's, a, it's another expo, um, and it's going to be the third to the fourth in Syracuse. And there's, uh, you can, if you're, if you're interested, they can look it up on the uh, Legends of the Cage uh, um, webpage. And, I, and like I said, Gary Goodrich and... Uh, Greg is on Twitter, and you just look my Twitter. Gary Goodrich on Twitter, and he, he's a good good starting off point. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Well, Gary Goodrich, you mentioned him. Uh, we've had him in the sit down in the past here on the rewind, and as you know, I'm sure well, he, he's gone through some challenging outcomes yeah. as a result of his fight career and the shots he's taken. Uh, you sound pretty, uh, uh, you know, clear of mind here on the interview. Um, but you know, I'm sure you know of some other folks who have mixed it up, uh, especially in those early era fights and emerged sort of worse for wear in terms of maybe short-term memory, in terms of like mental health and things like that. What, what do you make when you see Gary? Um, you know, what you know, what, what does that he, tell you? The lesson. Well, I, I'll tell you what. There's a lot to learn from Gary. Uh, number one, that no matter what your situation is, no matter how challenging your situation may be, you can still give back. And in giving back, one gets more than they realize. And then as, as you know, Gary has a little bit of, 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 of some memory issues, but he is still so super active with helping the kids and helping people and, and like with this organization. So, you know, it really, there isn't, no matter how, no matter what you're facing, it's going to go better if you're out trying to create positive in the world. I mean, he's all about that. And I'm learning a lot from Gary. Gary's an amazing individual. He's, he's very inspirational. He's, he's very positive. He's a great, great guy. It's incredible what he did with his career. I mean, he just, I had no idea how much fighting he did. I mean, he had yeah. like 200 fights and different things. And I thought he had a pretty cool, interesting thing. And it was okay. But compared to Gary, he, I'm just a, you know, I'm a, I'm a wee thing. <laughs> sure, you know? sure. So but, what, what is your life like these days, Paul? What, what are you up to in, in Fairbanks, and uh, what's your day-to-day -day like? Um, well, right now I'm actually just coming out of a workman's comp situation, which was a protracted five-year test of, of patience and um, patience and patience and patience. And uh, luckily yeah. I was. <laughs> and, but I'm just actually coming out the end of it. I've just 
I'm just in the, pro in the process of getting a settlement, and I'm going to um, be heading, north, heading south so I can do more expos, do more autograph signings, do more things. I want to see, do a motivational speaking with kids and, and with people with uh, issues and things, and I'm getting more active. I went into a real hibernation, you could say, and I'm yeah. getting out of my hibernation. So, yes. Sure. Yes. What was the, the workman's comp matter? Did you get hurt on a job or something? What happened yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I played football in college and high school and wrestled and UFC fighting. And, I mean, you name it, I've done it. And you know, fine. I'm at work one day carrying a box of stuff. I slip on a pin, go right down on my boots, and I broke one of the spindlets on my back and, and just completely messed my back up. I mean, it's amazing how... You know, you just see yourself as this, you know, kind of indestructible thing through life, and you get a little bit older in the years, and it's, you become more fragile. You know, I mean, wow. I'm still a dangerous individual. It's kind of funny. I've been asked you, so what's it like getting older and not being as, as you know, as dangerous as you were? I'm like, I'm actually more dangerous now than I was then because I'm hurt. I'm not in good condition. That means I'm not worried about your welfare. I'm out to finish you. I'm gonna do it ugly and fast. Oh boy, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I shudder to think. <laughs> I, when I was a kid, I used to worry about people. I used to be like, okay, I can't do this, I can't do that, because I could you know, hurt them really bad. But now, <laughs> I'm going to get it over as fast as I can, because I ain't got the wind and the time to do it. Do it Looking nice. for that exit. Look, a bloody exit, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of what kind of work were you doing, Paul, when you had this injury? I was office. I was working at Office Max. Um, I was manager of the uh, the furniture department, uh, which is you know I found it very difficult to work in the in the general like um, any kind of retail or anything where you're working with, with just people off the street because everybody knows me from the fighting. Like yeah. the fighting has been, it, it made, it brought a lot of attention. I shudder to say celebrity, but I guess so. And when you're trying to work and just do your normal thing, you got these wonderful people coming up and asking you questions. And your boss is looking at you like, oh, that's a little too much customer service. And so it, it really has kind of, kind of made it so I have to do alternative sort of things. But it's good. It's a good. It's a good thing. You know. Sure, sure. So you're there uh, working the furniture department at Office Max there in Alaska, and you're carrying something across the floor, and you slip and fall, and here we are, right? Yeah, here we are. Yeah, with a, with a mess. I got four screws, uh, two bars. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's like a jungle gym in my back, and so you, it never really took. So I'm still really very my, – my back's still very much injured, and um, – you know, I'm just glad the work this comp portion is over, and now I'm going to have a new match in the ring with my my former attorney. <laughs> it's going to be fun. So. <laughs> oh boy! Well, yeah, uh, oh, no, I love it. I do. I do. I've actually won yeah, two. Okay. I've won three cases so far. So on my oh, own. On, on the same injury or separate injury? No, 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 no. Like earlier, earlier when I was much younger, I, uh, when I was bouncing, I had to take a guy out. Because he, well, he tried to bite me, and so I threw him up in the air upside down, and he came down pretty hard. And he, he, he tried criminally, he tried civilly, and he lost both, and I defended myself. And another time, a buddy of mine in a wheelchair was being pushed around by some guys at a frat house, and I, I took care of that. So, you know, <laughs> so I mean, you know, it was, it was, you know, one was work related, the other was protecting my buddy. So, you know, sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah. You mentioned you mentioned bouncing. Um, yeah. I've always I've always wondered, Paul, uh, what was your let's say true fighting background coming into your UFC debut, UFC six, July fourteenth, nineteen ninety five against Cal Worsham. They build you as a trap fighter, as an exponent of trap fighting. Uh, yes, no yes. one no one, perhaps you included, <laughs> knew quite what that meant, but can can you tell us a little yes. bit about, you know, what fighting experience, if any, you had before coming into the UFC? That's a really great question. That's a super question because I didn't talk much about it at the time because I realized it was kind of insulting to a lot of people, but I actually had about, I got wrestled in high school. I did a little Taekwondo. Um, I was working out again with, with this martial arts called Trap Fighting, which was a, a little school with a, with a couple of kids. And, and I saw my first UFC on a weekend. I think it was UFC 3. And I was, was having beers with my buddy, and I, we made a $5 bet drunk that I could do the UFC or not. And so I go into the little school, and I mention to these kids that I want to do it. But I meant like in a year or two, or you know, just teach some serious training. And yeah. I, you know, they listen, and I go home, and I come back the next day, 
and they're like, we did it, we did it, we did it. I'm like, what'd you do? We got you in. You're in. You're in September's UFC, UFC six. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> exactly, man. Exactly. I was like, oh hey, guys, guys. Uh, but then I realized, you know what? This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I mean, it's crazy, but the one thing I do have is I've never been knocked out. I almost got knocked out once by Lovell Vonich, but like I've been hit in the head a lot, and you know, just coming up as a kid with shovels, trucks. I mean, I just I just don't go out real easy, and and so I knew I had that ability, and I started training my butt off. And to tell you the truth, I probably never would have made it to the UFC unless I was at this little school where they didn't care if I lived or died. They just wanted to get the UFC experience, and. Luckily, I had the, the ability to take a beating like a redheaded stepchild, and I had the power to put out some, you know, to put a good put, punch in, and my performance, because I don't quit. Like, my thing was never quitting. That was just unacceptable. So my performance was, it would peak when they stopped the fight with Tank, I was furious. I mean, he had his knee on my head, and he was, you know, scratching my head or whatever, but that's the last place in the world's gonna hurt me. I was good, I could've rode that out all night. And by the rules at the time, it was tap out or submission, or tap out or knockout. Sorry, tap out or knockout. Right. And I did neither, so I jump up. I'm yelling at John Tink, runs the other direction, and you know, and technically that was a, you know, that shouldn't have happened. But you know, I understand John's a good guy, and he was looking out for my welfare and everything. But the truth of the matter is, I had four months of training and a little trap at school, which was hardly, you know, really had what I needed. And I found that out at the UFC. I luckily did well, and I started training at AKA before AKA got really big with Brian Johnson. Brian Johnson brought me in as as a as a visitor, and he wanted to train for the UFC too. So we started training together. Me, him, and a guy named Brewster Thompson, who's a judo player. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there you go. The, the Johnson. So, yeah, I started thing. with really. Yeah, Brian, Brian Johnson. Of, uh, yeah, of AKA. He, he brought yeah, in. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Absolutely, yeah. He, he was my he, he introduced me to uh, Javier at, at Javier's AKA, and Javier never officially like represented me. He let me use his facilities, which was extremely generous and extremely wonderful of him. And we had the talk one time where I asked him, "Would you, you know, would you be my trainer?" And he said to me very, very wonderfully, "It was most, it was the greatest compliment I ever received, but it was a little disappointing." He said he couldn't train me in good faith because I had so far to go with just the basics mm -hmm. that he didn't feel comfortable with putting me in fights because I was already fighting. And he was just look, he was being professional. He was looking out for my welfare. But then on the other end of it, he said something amazing. He goes, you know, Paul, we're, you're missing in basic techniques. When you show up in the cage, you become something I've never even seen before. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. And, and you know, Javier doesn't just blow, blow any people in. So, you know, it, it's I was kind of a an anomaly, I would say. You know, I yeah. had the size, which is not always good, because when you've got the long arms, you get jammed up, and it's tough to get, you know, it's tough to fight out of. So you got to create distance, keep distance, and use and strike from far away. But if a guy jams you up, it gets real difficult. But, you know, I'm... It's, I, I learned and learned and learned and got better and better, and then the sport got banned. <laughs> so the trap fighting school, so trap fighting was actually a thing at whatever gym was this just, was? It was just like a little, like, dive training facility. I mean, it was just a place that I, I saw it on the street as I walked in, and so it wasn't really a style, okay? And so when I came back for UFC 7, I was no longer a trap fighter because they, they wanted me not to just exclusively train there, but they just didn't have what I needed. So we went, we separated paths. And so the UFC wanted me to pick a new name, just like they wanted something cool. I said, I'll just be a freestyle fighter. I just wanted to be freestyle fighter. Like, oh, that's not cool enough. That's not, that's not. And they kept hassling me. I'm like, okay, here, put this down. I put, I said, break this down. Put P H U C dash U. And they're like, they're like, no, 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 no. I'm like, no, no, that's it. It's a Vietnamese style. Learned it in <laughs> Vietnam. And it's it's a real deal, and I got an extra like a thousand dollars for the fights, and I put that on the on one of the cards. 
And I wish I would have done it. I really, you know, that thousand dollars it would have been worth it watching a girl walk around with a car with <laughs> I mean, T H U is T dash U, of course. But Understood. yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, I really wish I would have done that. I mean, I wish I would have followed through. But I, I had it by the by the cojones. It was great. Um, oh wow! So they, so, I think that I was, yeah. So where was the trap fighting school in Alaska or California? No, that was California. That was California. I'd been in California for a while. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so where did yeah. you grow up? Where did you grow up, Paul? Where were you born? I was I was I was raised in Alaska, and I got a football scholarship to San Jose State University after going to high, going all the way through high school up here. Oh, okay. All right. So you are an Alaska native then. That wasn't a gimmick for the polar bear thing. No, no, no. That's the real deal. Yeah. The, the, the polar bear got stuck with me in college football when we were oh, yeah. uh, yeah, at San Jose State. I actually played on the best team they had. Uh, we were 20th in the nation. Uh, we won the California Raisin Bowl, and uh, we beat Notre Dame. Notre Dame beat Stanford, and we were actually in a run for one. Or, I'm sorry. We beat Stanford. Stanford beat Notre Dame. And then we played the Hurricanes, and that's the year they were undefeated. And they destroyed us. Wow. The guys would jump over our guys, but, but we had a really good season. It was cool. Great ball game ring, and you know. Mm-hmm. And so when did you return to Alaska? I returned to Alaska in 2009. Cause, oh, okay. Yeah, the economy in California was was done. I mean, it was it was it was it was crazy. Yeah, I need so, to okay. start over. <laughs> What was your story as a kid? Were you uh, a tough guy, always an athlete, shy kid? What was the deal? <laughs> I was always a foot taller than everybody. I was thirteen sure, pounds. Sure. Of, I was thirteen pounds at birth, and that's my breakup line with most girls. I keep that a secret. And I'm, if I know a girl really loves me, she'll stick around once I say I was thirteen pounds at birth. If not, <laughs> the dust doesn't hit the ground before she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I was always like a foot taller than everybody. So I was. It was kind of an, you know, I didn't quite fit in, and so I wasn't, I didn't really get into the bully thing. I just was kind of uh, shy and, and you know, um, kind of a, more protective than, 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 you know, I don't know. I, I don't think I could play with the other kids was King of the Hill, and I'd have to throw a couple of rounds for, for the kids playing with me, so. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, sure. What did your, uh, what did your parents do? Um, well, I didn't, I not my mom didn't really do. She was a, a, a homemaker, and my dad was a homemaker. So, <laughs> can you imagine that? <laughs> no, I can. I mean, I've interviewed a lot of fighters over the years, and I—that's uh, not an uncommon background, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was challenging. It was challenging, and you're right in the fact that I, I hear the same things, and not only in fighting, but in in a lot of sports, you'll mm-hmm. see that. The Hall of Fame is full of people that are smaller, not as don't seem as they're not as quick. They're not as on paper. They're not the athletes that you think they'd be. But when it came to performance time, they blew the doors off. And and a lot of those people came from extremely challenging childhoods. And uh, is that part of is that part of why? You know, the kind of work that Gary Goodrich is doing, the kind of work you were talking about at the beginning of the interview speaks to you is because of your childhood and knowing the kind of absolutely. boost a kid might need. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's nothing more. The, the most the, the, one of my favorite memories of that part of my life as being a fighter was there was a, a neat coincidence with a game called um, Tekken 2. And there was a character called Big Paul, with a big blonde flat top, and his boss character was a polar bear. And so I go into the 7-Eleven, and there's a little kid playing the, the, the big pole character. And I, I walk in a pop quarter, and I start playing the polar bear. And the little kid looks up, and he's all, oh, you're the, I'm all, yep. And he's playing the, yep. So, oh, wow. And, oh, my goodness, that was a great moment. Like, I'll, I'll never forget that. Like, just being able to touch someone and give, make their day a little better yeah. is probably one of the most, I don't know, I don't know if there's anything better. You know, winning, wow. great, but but uh, but inspiring people that are having a bad day or just 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 for any reason at all, that's pretty damn cool to me. So, so you go out to San Jose, you there's you, a lot of it. Hmm? So you go out Sorry. to San Jose, you play football. No, no problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. When what did you do? Did you start bouncing during college? After college? No, I I I, I ended up bouncing after the fighting because I. I hit a real skid, like lots of people do in life, and I hit a month where just 
everything that could go wrong, would go wrong, did go wrong, and I kept saying like a moron, it can't get any worse. And of course it did. So, you know, I learned a lot of lessons that period of time, and one of them was patience, and sometimes there's nothing you can do but just go for the ride. And I really wasn't into where I was, what I was doing, because prior my life was a dream that came true that I never had. So I'm pretty lucky to even experience that. But mm -hmm. that, that the bouncing period was a survival mode. I was in survival mode for about, I think I'm just getting out of it, to tell you the truth, about, about, about six months ago. With the, right? the, oh, yeah, with Legends of the Cage and with uh, this case finally coming into a place where it's moving. Um, yeah, no, it's just been a real, you know, it's just been a, it's, people face challenging times, and, and I'm a firm believer that these challenging times prepare us for what's next, and so, like, just out of the blue, Brian Moore calls me, but with Legends of the Cage, and starts saying, you know, he, he might be doing these things, I'm like, he's here all the time, you know, and I go, yeah, sure, 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 and next thing I know, he's he's got the UFC Expo for me, I'm like, I couldn't, I'm like, it's, I'm so far out of that world, it was amazing. The, that experience, yeah, well, oh my God, the expo is amazing. Yeah, we what was it to, like to to just to imagine it would kind of be like waking up, you know, after being in a coma and like yeah. everything is advanced 20 years, right? What was it like walking you know, around that's, Vegas? That's a great analogy. That is a great analogy. And, it, and it's amazing to see a guy like Mike Mouse if you come over and say, you want to buy a picture with me and Gary? You know, and, and the guys who are doing it now, the, you know, the big the, the big wigs now, they're, they're they get that look of, of, of we were their inspiration at some point. And that's just, oh my, I can't even, I can't explain how cool that is. But even cooler was meeting kids who were facing health issues. Their lives are really extremely challenging on a level that there's nothing they can do about it and it has nothing to do with them. I mean, they're just, they're just, you know, they're just in their situation. And getting to meet with those kids and their family and the families of them and helping their life a little better was really amazing, really amazing. And I think the more that any organization does, the UFC, and any sporting or any person in the world can take the time to help those who are struggling. Uh, if you're not doing it, you should be. Give it some thought. That's all. Yeah. Well, well, I'm glad to hear, at least for one, glad to hear that you feel like you're coming out of a rough patch. Uh, oh, you yeah. know, when a fighter kind of disappears as you did for so long, one one thinks the worst. You know, one worries. Uh, you know what? You would have been right, except for maybe I was dead. <laughs> it was bad. It was bad, and I made a lot of bad choices, and I did a lot of things that were not, you know, probably for my best interest, but. When, you know, when you hit a point where you've never, you know, you've just never been someplace like that before, you just don't know what you're going to do because you've never been there. You've, you're not prepared for something. You just, you make bad choices. And, uh, sure. but you learn and then you share them with people later and help them not do it. So there's, can, there's can you, maybe, maybe to somebody listening, Paul, can you do a little bit of that for somebody? Not to pry, but could you be a little more specific about the struggle and, 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 well, and what it is you dealt with? Well, I mean, when we're hurting, we'll do anything to stop it or think we're stopping it. Uh, temporary fixes can be anywhere from sexual encounters to, to drugs. Yep. And those are temporary cover-ups for a bigger picture that if we don't address the bigger picture, those temporary things become problems themselves. And in 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 that those things can be fine in the moment, and if they are visited and left behind, no problem. But if they can't be left behind, they obviously are an issue. So I'm just getting to a point where I'll be able to, I'm, I'm putting together presentations and things, and I'll be more specific with things when I have it already together. But I'm a little bit ahead of that point. So I'll just say that there's, there's nothing that I would judge anybody on Mm -hmm. because there's nothing that any of us are not capable of, including myself. And if anyone need helps, needs help through it, um, if we have partaken of it ourselves and had made the mistakes ourselves and, and gotten through it, it, we owe it to the world and ourselves to help others through. So.
Sure. I know it's super vague right now, but it's like I said, I'm in the process of getting to where I can do this. And the strange thing is this: is that some things have such stigma in the world that oh yeah, that the moment we're not doing it anymore, and we're and we're on the other side saying, hey, I can help people with with, with getting better, you become a hero. But until that happens, the stigma is real. Yes, and. You know, stigmas and, and, and stereotypes are there for a reason because most people fall into them, and I understand it, and, but not everybody does. So, you know, so I, I know where to be cautious, and I know where to, uh, I know when and where how, because my biggest enemy in the dark period was my mouth. So yeah. I've learned to, uh, I've learned to time and place, place and time, and you know, I'm not embarrassed of anything. I just know that the timing of things are so crucial. And you can go from being helping people because you're, what you've done is heroic and you've made it the right choice and you've made the move, the move on, or you can be some sad tale because people know things about you that they shouldn't know yet. <laughs> sure, so, sure, yeah, and it's, it's obviously you know. uh, totally in your wheelhouse and, and prerogative uh, to come yeah, forth yeah. with those things. Uh, and we look forward to, to hearing, you know, the, the lessons that you can teach. But uh, you mentioned earlier that, you know, part of the reason for a, I mean, a bit of a slide into a dark period for you was living that fantasy life for a while at the very beginning of the sport, the formative days of the sport being uh, a very memorable character in that, you know, kind of uh, – tapestry of different guys we saw so let's start with um the cal worship fight you hit him in the back of the head with an elbow in a minute two in casper wyoming and he fell down and uh the world got to know uh, paul varlins you then stepped out against tank later that night as you mentioned earlier your memories of ufc six i mean what what flashes to mind when you think of that night july 95 well let me let me help you out a little bit take another look at the tape of cal worship i yeah. actually caught him in the shoulder oh wow that was a, that was a body blow knockout which I've not seen any others. I've seen stomach punches where they go down and cover up because they get the wind knocked out of them. I've seen, um, yeah, I've never seen a body. And, and you take a look at the thing, I hit him right in the sciatic nerve, right, right, and I didn't mean to. I didn't aim for this. I didn't know that at the time. But I, but I was, it was explained to me later that I, not, I was able to knock him out because I hit the nerve that runs right down the neck. And so uh -huh. yeah, that was, a, that was a, uh, a body blow knockout, and you know it's a real knockout because the hands stop. Problem. You can't fall forward with your hands, but you put your you pull your hands up. It's just a natural reaction. So that's one of the things I ever get credit for. So I just thought I'd throw it out there. <laughs> well, yeah, people have said that he just like completely lost gas in that thin air and just was basically quit. Just just slumped to the canvas to quit. But you're saying the the the, the positioning of his body speaks otherwise. Well, I dare anybody to fall face forward with their hands down. Yeah, try it. It's you mean not, without using your hands to brace yourself? Without using your hands to catch yourself or putting your hands up and putting yourself to protect your face. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's, that's, a, that's an involuntary reaction. So it's like that kind of, if everybody wants to argue about it, ask them to do the fall. So <laughs> There you go. So, uh, so, so, that, so what did it feel like? I mean, you're, you're in these bright lights. You kind of got, as you mentioned, thrust into this position, and you just knocked the guy out. Well, you know what? Up until I did it, I wasn't sure. I mean, we all think to ourselves, we can do this, we can do that. And we may even put our butts on the line. But when you get to the smoke and the lights, mm -hmm. and then you see the cameras, and then you realize to yourself, oh, my God, cameras. I forgot there's cameras. The whole world's watching this. Oh, my God, if I get punked, I'm going to be a punk for the rest of my life. I mm -hmm. wanted to run. <laughs> but I knew it was too late. So I broke through the smoke. I made the decision. And when I got the win, when I, when I got the win, and I don't know if you noticed, but the, the cameraman leans in <laughs> into the octagon, which I just earned, I believe, and the polar bear was kind of in charge, and I ran, I rushed the camera and headbutted the camera. Yep. And <laughs> that was real. That wasn't staged. That wasn't people keep asking me that. I'm like, that was just a moment of exhilaration and, like, living up to one's, expect one's dreams. And then, like, I don't know, I felt like I owned the octagon at that point. Like, I just earned that space. And I was like, what are you doing in my octagon? Blam! And I just, that's, that's I'm, I'm so glad I did it, but I'm so embarrassed at the same time. Like, it's embarrassing, <laughs> but it's, it's just who I am, you know. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I, it was wonderful. It was Casper Wyoming. It was so wonderful. And there's some footage for Entertainment Tonight 
was there and interviewed people. And they interviewed me before the fight. And then after the fight with Hank, I had this huge big swell on my face. I didn't look very good. And they, their, 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 their interviewer comes rushing into my backstage thing, and he's ready for something other than I gave him. Because you can see, and they use this on, on Entertainment Tonight, he thrusts the camera in my face, and I'm kind of turned to the side. And he's all, so, so what do you think of the UFC now? And he's, mm. he's thinking I'm going to be all like, oh, I got hurt, boo-boo. But I turn to him, and I got this huge swell on my face, like a grapefruit, and I go, I had the best time of my life. This is the last true bastion of freedom in the nation. If I did this on the streets, I'd be going to prison. I wow. loved it. And his microphone, this is what I love about so much. The microphone went from like being a boner all straight in my face to drooping. Like he, he was so shocked <laughs> when I said, the microphone just goes boop. <laughs> it's just like, look, look, his erection, it just fell. I, that was, I, I wish I could find that footage. If anybody has that, I would get just about anything for a copy of that again. I lost oh, everything yeah. in a fire. Oh, did yeah. you really? I lost all my memorabilia. I lost everything but my car and the clothes on my back. And oh, a fire. Terrible. When, when did I, that happen to you? Recently? or? No, that was, that was, I'm going to see, that was 90, 97, 98. 98. Okay, yeah. 98, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah, that was right after, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it was, I'm sorry, 2001, 2001. 2001. Yeah, 2001. So after yeah. your fight career, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was way after the fight career. It was, it was kind of one of the last things after I hit about a two-month period where just literally everything, I, I, I didn't want to, you don't want to hear it, you don't want to hear it. It's just, it was just everything that I, that I loved was, was revoked one way, shape, or another. And, uh, you know, when, when the UFC got banned by McCain, I couldn't believe that the lawyers for SEG, the former owners of, of the UFC, were very short-sighted, which I kind of knew already, but I, I, I called them up, and because, you know, usually we do contract negotiations, and they have, they have a hard time with things. I, I can handle my contracts. Um, mm -hmm. But I said to them, I said, you guys are going to, uh, like, like subpoena McCain, right? And they're like, what do you mean subpoena McCain? I go, he's a keynote speaker for the Boxing Commission. That is a yeah. conflict of interest. That used to be a law. You know that? It's a law that's disappeared. It's called conflict of interest. If you have money coming to you from an organization and you're a representative of four people and you choose to just independently step up and take an issue like that, and you're taking money from a group that has a, they have another agenda, that is, that is pure conflict of interest. And <laughs> I'm not going to say who at UFC, but somebody who runs things at UFC basically told me, if my head was on fire, I wouldn't take a bucket of water from you. Wow. Hmm. And, well, and you know, and his reasoning, his really great reasoning was, UFC 7, where I fought, Marco Huas for so long, um, they didn't buy enough cable time for that UFC. So no. half, half of the cable companies pulled the plug. Yeah. And this person's logic, <laughs> his logic, no wonder he didn't make any money at the UFC. Um, his logic was, I was sick. I was legitimately sick at UFC 7. I had a 104 degree temperature. I was white, sweating. I was horrible. Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you listen to the footage, they talk about how I'm eating garlic and grapefruit the whole time to try and... Um, oh, that's right. Yes, the garlic. Yeah. Yes, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. I was sick as a dog. I was so sick. And that's part of the reason why I did so well is I relaxed, took the pressure off myself, and said, I'm just going to do as well as I can. And right. I just, poof, poof, first two were so fast. I needed them to be because I had no energy. And when Marco Lewis was kicking me in the leg, that kept eating the energy because it hurt so much. But, but, but the, the point of the story was the person who was one of the top guys, maybe, maybe the top guy, I'm not going to say, but um, his, his logic was that I was running a game, like a psychological game on everybody, that I wasn't really sick. And it was hmm. somehow my fault that, that they, they lost their money because – if everybody would have known that I was really healthy, they would have fought me real. Like, they wouldn't have felt bad for me. I'm like, right. They wouldn't have dragged the fight out? Is that what they mean? 
Yeah, his, his point was that their fight wouldn't have went that long. If, if Marco was not, I was in six, he would have just took me out like that. I mean, this guy, wow. yeah, seriously, man, I mean, talk about delusional. But you know what? Because he wanted to, he, he wanted it to be that way, I, after that point, I was like, that's right, that's right, man. I'm the guy who took all your money. I took, what, what, seven million, eight million? How many million did I take from you? You know, because once they're thinking that, what are you going to do? Cry? No, shove it up the you know themselves. Sure. Well, they they lost money on because they had to refund people, right? Because they missed yeah. the main event. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And people, I came home. People didn't know if I won or lost. It was crazy. I mean, I was, yeah. you know, and he listen. Every show, they SEG thought every show, not everybody at SEG, but let's just say the head guy. No, I did. Well, I didn't say that. Um, was they had a we're going to beat this horse till it's dead, then we're going to walk away. Mm -hmm. They expected every show to be the last one. Mm -hmm. And when I think about what a money grubber he is and how much pain he must be in when he sees how successful he is, I sleep well at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you this. I will say this. Um, if, if, that, if that night, if Marco Huas' performance at UFC 7 was him feeling bad for you, I'd hate to see what he would have done if he really wanted to kill you. Absolutely. Marco Huas is an amazing competitor. I mean, that, our fight was so like it was such an exploration of each other we were doing things that were just we were like doing different things like the foot stomping me grabbing over the cage because i didn't want to lose my back you know like i knew you don't lose your back and like just we just were doing different things and it was you know i got him in that reverse naked choke and I'm not sure. I can't prove it. I don't know. But number one, let me state this. He didn't break any rules because there was no rule at the time about this. But when I got him up in, in the rear, in that, 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 the guillotine, reverse guillotine, and he got him up in the air, I would have, if I could have held on to him, rolled my back, come up in superior. But when I got him up there, I couldn't get his head to stay in. And it mm -hmm. felt kind of, I don't know, it was sweaty. I'll just say it was really, really, really sweaty. And no matter what happened, he's a cagey fighter. I respect the hell out of him. And his, he respected me. I respected him. And I put pictures of him winning in that fight on my Facebook page all the time because his, the look on his face is of relief, not of dominance, not of, you know, he just had a cakewalk, is that, you know, that he just had the fight of his life. And that's all I've ever wanted was to do the best I can and have the respect of my opponents and my self-respect, and, you know, that's what it was about for me. And like I said, Marco was, I have so much respect for him that he's incredible. He's so incredible. So please don't take anything other than that from, the, from what I'm saying. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, back quickly, if we could, to UFC 6. After Worsham, you fought Tank. Um, yeah. We, we already kind of discussed that. Um, Sorry, well, I got ahead of you. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that is fine. Not at all. That That's great because I did, of course, want to get to the Marco Huas fight, so it was nice to sort of check that box. But um, there was an interesting kind of series of backstage occurrences there um, at UFC oh. 6. Yeah. Um, yeah, after yeah, yeah, yeah. the... The tank fight, uh, Pat Smith, who was supposed to fight Oleg Tokhtarov next, uh, came right. down with some kind of illness or ailment backstage, and right. uh, everyone started scrambling, trying to find a replacement. At one point, um, the aforementioned Brian Johnston is approached, right? I, I wondered right. if you could recall recall all that chaos for us. It's, it's an interesting part of history. Oh, God. You know, there was, from what I recall, and I, I, I wasn't privy to everything, but what I heard, there was a there wasn't enough room on an elevator, and the process of trying to gain that room got a little rough, I guess, and mm -hmm. Patrick got injured. Oh, really? And Tank used to go rolling around with a lot of guys. Um, a very young Tito Ortiz, I believe, was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think he was in the elevator at the time. I don't think he was the, one of those guys. But Tank had a whole group. He had more. He had as many people with him as, as the Gracies would, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, so his group were punks. I'm not going to play around. They were punks. Uh, yeah. They were bullies. They were everything that he he says he is. They were, and yeah. um, and they, they 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 jumped they jumped at him. Yeah. So I mean that's what I didn't see, but the word is, and I believe it because I know from the source. And uh, you know, like your atypical bully. 
you know, they they basically were looking for, you know, the any any way, shape or form they could give their boy a, a shot, there we go. So, you know, that was that's that was what I, you know, kind of weeded out of it now. I've got no love for tank. I love every one of the guys I've fought except for Tank because mm -hmm. of well, because of how he is. I mean, you know yeah. I mean, he's just, he just—he is the way he is, and hey, I, at least he stands—he stands by his ways. I'll give him that. He stands sure. by who he is. He doesn't make—he doesn't mince words about it. But um, you know, if you ever get a corner with him, you take him off pass because he'll he'll do anything. Never, so, never underestimate this. Yeah, yeah. You know. Sure, sure. There's the tank, yeah. the tank part. Um, they they were looking for an opponent now that Pat Smith wasn't going to be able to fight talk to Rav and right. did they approach right. they approach Brian at one point about trying to do it. I am okay. I'm not sure what happened with that. I know that I think they did, but I think Brian wanted to do it in the time period that he was planning on, which is mm -hmm. smart. Which is that's was the difference between that's why that's why Javier worked with with Brian because Brian was. He understood how to do things the right way, where you know, like you, you, you use the time that you got to prepare to to max. And, and Brian's a guy; he's an incredible athlete. And he's so skilled, and yeah, you know, yeah. If he could have melded us together, we would have, we would have been perfect. <laughs> right. So what ends up uh, ultimately happening, interestingly enough, was uh, uh, Anthony Macias goes out there with Oleg, yeah. and it's uh what was the feeling backstage? I mean, that was pretty much that pretty much went down as as the first work fight in UFC history. Both guys <laughs> were managed by Buddy Albin, the same guy. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. You, you know, it, that was you know I don't know if you remember too. He was the same guy. I think that I said jokingly during an interview. Somebody said, "What would you do in this that would be different than anybody else?" And I said. I think I said throw somebody out of the ring, and somebody I'm not sure if it was him, but said it was these words I was going to do that. But I really didn't even mean that. I was just making an off cuff remark, and then it went all crazy. But yeah, you know, I, I, God, I guess so. I guess so. I, I hate to think that because it really damages our lineage. But if it is, it is. You know, if it is, it is. And I'm not going to argue it. Do I know personally for sure? No, do I want to say it? No, but could it have been? Was it probably? Yeah, you know. Well, that night, Paul, are you watching a monitor? Are you just basically checked out and not paying attention? Were you part of the buzz was, around? Well, no. After you, well, after um, after the tank fight, I was pretty swollen up. I was pretty swollen up, and absolutely, and and I was actually kind of bummed because I didn't think I was coming back. Like I didn't, you know, like I was, I, you know, I didn't win, but, but because of, you know, like they came actually not, not, uh, our Davies and, and Kevin McLaren came to me and they're like, we loved it. It was awesome. You get another shot. We're sorry about that. Shouldn't have been stopped. Like Kevin McLaren and Art Davies were awesome. When I, when I complain about SEG, it has nothing to do with Campbell McLaren or Art Davies. They were both stand up guys who were very realistic and very 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 human and very they cared about the fighters um yeah. so I, I just want to make note of that um sure. yeah so they came and let me know that i was going to be in it and then i was like oh, okay cool i can i got some time to really do this thing right you know and um I actually yeah i got in trouble at dinner afterward because i told one of the guys that i really trained for four months and he yeah. started yelling at me <laughs> I was like, well sorry he goes don't, just, that's disrespectful, man. These guys have done 10, 20 years in their prospective, you know, fields. And I'm like, oh, wow, I, I kind of got it, you know. And mm -hmm. I got in trouble twice at the dinner, once with opening my mouth about, about the, the lack of training, and second was with, with um, uh, what was his name, Joe, uh, the, the, not Joe, uh, the, the, the guy was fullback. He was like a real famous fullback. Uh, Jim Brown? Jim Brown, yeah, Jim Brown. He, he, you remember what he said during the, the broadcast? Um, he, I know he, he had, had some kind of... He kind of had a gaffe, a little bit of a gaffe, I'd say. I'm trying to be respectful, because I do respect what he's done. Sure, sure. Um, but he, he happened to say that the human bite is the most poisonous bite in the world. And when I was at the dinner, and he's kind of a couple people down for me, as, he, as I hear that for the first time, I choke and I start giggling, you know, because it was funny. <laughs> And he looks at me, he's all, you got a problem? And like, 
sir, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. Just sorry, my bad, my bad. You bet. You gotta say something. Say something, boy. And I'm like, oh, boy, really? You know, that's you know, if you're gonna get a guy going. And I basically said, you know, but I just explained what he, you know, that what the thing was, and he pretty much flipped out. And I decided to kind of go down a couple more spaces and stuff because, you know, mm-hmm. I really it was disrespectful of me, but I couldn't help it. You know, I couldn't help it because it, 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 the human right isn't poisonous, and I should have kept my mouth shut. Right? <laughs> like yeah, I said, I, I could, I could definitely see at least cracking a smile if somebody says that with a straight face. You know, but he's a legend. The guy's a legend, you know? So, right. so I mean, I, mean I, I, I do respect, I have respect. I respect legends and I respect people. And I shouldn't have said what I said. And I, especially, you know, I'm a, I'm a little older, a little smarter. But, you know, it was funny. <laughs> sure. So you were, you were a bit worried, uh, or at least it crossed your mind after you lost to Tank, that they wouldn't have you back? Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I, I mean, I was I didn't like that performance. I was very frustrated. I mean, I was I was kicking from the bottom position. John couldn't see it, but I was actually kicking him, and he was all he was doing was holding the fence and squeezing out on my head with his knee, no striking, and I was kicking him, but I felt like nobody could see it, especially John who needed to see it, and I was I'll tell you what the. I can't remember the last time I thought about quitting in a fight. Yeah. I'm thinking about cute girls in the, in the stands. I'm thinking about my laundry. I'm thinking about, oh, did I get that ticket signed off? I'm thinking about everything but quitting, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no matter how bad it's going. And I've had <laughs> Mark Kerr in Brazil painted it to me really good, but once again, didn't quit. And, and it was, I got a standing ovation. It was amazing. Brazilians are great. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, that's that's my – legacy and my strongest, you know, the thing that I like to be proud of most is that the quitting is just not an option. That's not smart, by the way. If you're listening to me, up, uh, you're about to get your arm pulled off, tap out. Just tap out. Tap out. <laughs> yeah. Mon- not monkey see, monkey do as far as that goes. Yeah, exactly. A, a, Rush, a guy in Kiev, in, in Russia, he made me separate his arm. He wouldn't tap. I had him in the middle of the ring, had, had him in a key lock. Just there was he was gonna go nowhere, and I put it in as slow as I could because I didn't want to hurt him. I, re- I had respect for the guy, and he wouldn't quit. And so I'm just slowly but surely putting this thing in, and I can hear the ligaments tearing and muscles ripping. I'm getting sick to my stomach. I don't even. I'm not enjoying this, and so I drag him into his corner. I'm like, would you throw in the, the dang towel? You want me to kill him? Mm. And so they finally did it. And I look at, they raise my arm, I look over his shoulders hanging down. Like, I mean, I messed his shoulder up. I, mean, I don't want to hurt anybody long term. And But I realized something. My little rule about um, never tapping out uh, is kind of ridiculous. But I can't, I can't not be that way. But mm-hmm. I realize that it's not the smartest thing to do. You know what I mean? Would that have been that. a poor uh, Valerie Nicolin? Was that the person that you yeah. did that to? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, March, tough, March 30th, 96, Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, I'll never forget the buzz about that because, of course, the UFC had, was was a bit of a was a bit of a smash on U.S. pay per view as this just yeah. you know new blood sport. And then you heard about this event that was being staged and you know completely built in the image of the UFC in, in an exotic but way. Now. But he always was paying, uh, paying back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there was a kind of a split with SEG there, and he was going to take him on. He was even going to use the word ultimate in promoting the event, and uh, Bob Myrowitz was uh, making the long-distance phone calls to try to stop that, as I understand it. But uh, ultimately, the word ultimate is scratched out in black on the canvas that night if you go back and watch any of the fights. Um, but that aside, you're in there, you're in the tournament. Uh, you had that aforementioned fight against Nicolin, which you won, and then fought Igor Volchanchin, who was 18,000 people. Uh, and you're in this tournament, and it is, there's mob influence, there's, you know, the tension over with the UFC feeling like uh, it's a sabotage attempt. What were just the politics, if not the fights, in the air there in Kiev in 1996? Well, okay, Here, you, wanna, you, you mentioned the mob. And, like, every time I fought overseas, which is a lot, it was mob money. And on my way out of Kiev, I mean, they've got guys with machine guns, and I'm in bulletproof Mercedes Benzes, and I'm a little stressed out. I've never had this much security. I've never, never known I needed this much security. Yeah. And so on the way, actually, on the way out to the airport, I, I go to thank my guys with, you know, 10 guys with machine guns on the back of this Mercedes van, 
And I'm like, hey, guys, you know, I felt so safe this whole time. Thank you so much. And they're like, one guy laughs at me. And I learned the true meaning of the word stoicism. Mm. Rush, Rush, Russians not only suffer, but they do it with pride. It's part of their identity. Mm-hmm. And this gentleman says to me, he goes, you're very funny. You're very, you're very funny. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He goes, you're the protecting us. I'm like, what? You're the, okay, when you leave, my family, we put the event on, yes? Two other families bigger than us, we don't, we don't involve them. They're not happy with us. You're gone, we're dead. They won't do nothing to us while you're here. But when you're gone, we're the fucking dead. And they all laughed. Wow. They all laughed together as a, as a group. Like they were going to go down fighting. And, but they knew they were dead. They were outmanned, outgunned. And I was like, just a shiver went through me. I was yeah. sitting with dead men. So why were they, why were they show, so sure that somebody was going to be mad that they made this much money on an event or something? Because, because the families, the other two families in the city came to him and said, what were you thinking? I mean, I, I could paraphrase what he told me, you know, but, but basically their fans already let them know that since they didn't involve them with, the, with it, um, they were going to... I see. They cut them out of the action, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Out of respect, a respect thing, they should have done something, and, you know, and it's, and it's not the foot soldiers' job to decide these things, it's the upper guys, so, you know. Sure. I mean, yeah. I had a lot of mob experiences, it was really kind of crazy. Yeah. Well, here's uh, here's this show, and uh, you fight Wolf Chanchin, and um, he was he had a lot of firepower on him, and uh, he actually <laughs> dropped you uh, there in the fight. What, what are your memories? Um, you know the squiggly lines you see in those in those 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 kind of imaginary TV shows of what it's like being knocked out, or sure. like when Brad Pitt goes gets hit and goes into the water during Snatch. A lot like that. I like, had never been that close to being knocked out before. And if 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 um, the the referee who was uh, dang it, I should have done um, Andy Anderson. Thank you, Andy Anderson. Didn't intercede. He probably would have knocked me out. And yeah. I've never been that close to him. He hit like a ton of bricks. I, he was like Popeye, except for big arms. He had big fists. They didn't look real. The end of his little short arms were his fists. They, they looked like, like hammers, like big sledgehammers. And they hit just like it. I mean, I'm, <laughs> yeah, me sitting, I was putting, I was putting my way back up when Andy stuck it in. Because, I mean, I'll keep coming until I'm done. But, Man, I've never been hit that hard before. And there's a picture of him doing, I think, a Superman punch to Sap. And I think he knocks Sap out with that Superman punch. And he really looks like Superman flying through there. He's got a big fist in front of him. He's jumping up high to catch him in the chin. And I don't even remember the punch he hit me with. Like, it, just, it was boom. And I was like, wow. Was like, Did you have any was... clue coming in, Paul, what, what he was capable of? Had you heard of him? Had any chance to get the measure of him? <laughs> I never had a chance to give a measure of the rules. Okay, like each, <laughs> each each fight I went into had a different, especially overseas, had a different set of rules and regulations. When I fought in in Pink Race in Japan, uh, that was a lot of rules. I mean, there's a lot of things that are different. And one of the cool, I wish I could get a copy of that fight. That's another one I wish I could get a copy of. I'm fighting Yanni Agasawi. He's a great competitor, and I had learned a lot of locks and, and, and a lot of locks and, and submission holds and all the things you need for pancreation. And they weren't expecting that from me. They thought I was going to be this brawler, dude. And I came in, and I, I respected the rules, and I was doing it, – it went for me being an outsider. I could really feel the difference between the fighter's attitude of me within a, a minute or two of the fight. And – all of a sudden, my corner got filled with their guys, and, and, and me and I were having a good fight. We, had like, we were within one point of each other, and the referee starts giving him points that weren't his, and he stops the referee and and, and, and <laughs> takes the points back. It was amazing. And I, I hit him with an open palm strike. That's what you do when you're standing. Um, or no, when you're on the ground, so I hit him on the ground with open palm strike, and I broke his nose, he was bleeding bad, and they, they took a lot of time to get his nose back together, and in pancreas, it's really quiet, I mean, you can hear a pin drop, I've never been in anything like that before, and there's like 35,000 people, and the, the, the rings lit up, but the, the, you can't see the fans, and they're silent. And so out of the blue, about five minutes in, somebody goes, blah, 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 and I'm like, so I wave to where I think it is, and the crowd, 
goes nuts in that section. So I do this, this standing wave like in a circle, and the crowd goes nuts as I do it, and the promoter's so angry at me because that's <laughs> not what they do with these shows. These shows are supposed to be very reserved, very respectful, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And you, yeah, and it was it was fun. It was fun, and Yanni was amazing. It was amazing that he wouldn't let the the you know, the, the promoter pump up the score, and he beat me legitimately by by a, a, by two points, a point or two points, and we had a great match. And afterward, all the Japanese guys were like, "We didn't know you could do tech, didn't know you were technical." And it was like it was it was night and day coming into that organization, then leaving. And I, I really wish I could have gotten more pancreation, but. Um, the, 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 once again, the promoter didn't like me. I'm, I was a, I was a difficult thing to promote because I didn't have a style or something you could sell videos about. You know, this is the polar bear style of fighting or whatever. Um, I jokingly call it huge jitsu or huge jitsu. Drop the H. Hmm. And you know, if it if it's soft, crush it. If it bends, break it. If it <laughs> if it moves, stomp it. Then that's you know, I mean. So, you know, I wasn't marketable, but I was, they were stuck with me because my attitude, the fans loved my attitude. And, um, yeah, so I, I, I made the most of what I had, so it was fun. Sure. How do you, um, do you wear it as a badge of honor that your big calling cards in the sport, besides, besides let's say, the Worsham win, were these just devastating losses to Huas and to Kerr and to Igor, um, these these fights that really illustrated how violent this thing could be when guys came in with sharp weapons, you know. Do, yeah, do you feel com- comfortable being that guy, or does it kind of suck? No, absolutely, absolutely, because I'm the guy that that in the face of sharp weapons and heavy 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 machinery, and I yeah. never quit. I kept getting up. That that's what when I when I talk to kids and people about how we get through life when life challenges us. It's, it's not a matter of if it's going to challenge us. It's when it's going to challenge us and how far it's going to challenge us. And if we just get up, just keep getting up, we'll be okay. And so right. that's, that's so my actions in, the, in the fighting support what my message I'm trying to send. And, it, and I wouldn't know how to send a message I don't believe in. I mean, I've, I've been down, you know, this, this period of time I've been down for a little bit. I got a little bit mixed up, and that's okay, but I'm getting back up. As long as you get back up, you're, you'll be fine. Uh, I'm not going to get off of the uh, Ukraine show without asking you about uh, going out drinking afterwards. And, uh, <laughs> a story that I've heard a hundred times. Uh, not yeah. a hundred, that, That's an exaggeration, but many times, many different versions. Yeah. Uh, you and your buddy, Boss, Rutten. Yes. We all know Great him. Guy. We all know. Yes. Yep. We, he deserved he deserved his, his place in the Hall of Fame, and it was great to see him again. And uh, yeah, yeah. Did, did, he, did he though yeah. try to toss you through another glass window, Paul Varlins? Well, you know what? We were drinking a bunch, and and he's like any fighter has will always have his edge. He will always be. I could take you, man. I could take you. And of course, I'm a fighter saying, no, no, you couldn't, no, you couldn't. And the poor Russian mob guys are like, oh my god, oh my god, they're going to fight. You know, like, how do we, who do we protect? What do we do? And every club there was like a mixture of a strip club, a restaurant, a dance club, and uh, and whatever else, you know. Sure. And they all had American names. And I think we were at the Chicago club. And so he's like, I could, he's all, I could just throw one kick and knock you out right now. Not if I choke you. And he, as I go, when I go by him, I, I try to choke him, and he. He, he, what did we, I, I guess I bit him. I don't remember. I was really, really drunk. And he did put, he put me through a glass window. Mm-hmm. He just did a, he did the judo throw, you know, when you get somebody gets behind you. And I went right over the top. I was drunk as snot. And uh, there was, you know, I mean, I, 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 man, that's, that's awesome. Dude, I got thrown through a glass room with, with my boss Rudin. And, and, but the scary part, the scary part was at the hospital where I had to get sewn up before I could get on my flight. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! The the, sh- the the doctor looked like Chef Blardy had a big white hat that was super tall, and all of the equipment <laughs> looked like it was from 1949, and my oh, stitches were hockey laces. I was like, "This is like before the movie Hostel came out." I was having a hostel moment. Seriously. Like wow. it, was, it was nuts, man. It's all the little things that really get wild in, in my stories, you know. It's just, yeah, you know, 
I would, hey, I'm, I'm wearing the badge, badge of honor, but Bob Sturgeon is one of those bad men in the world of all time. And that me and him, he goofed around. is awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing about that story is that it wasn't a real beef fight. It was really horseplay, that, but it was drunk horseplay, horseplay between two fighters. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, exactly. You go through the mirror. What what kind of injuries, where did you get cut going through I the... the, the, the... Before my, my forearm, like on my elbow, got gashed open. And, you know, he didn't need to do it. And, you know, I, we were, like I said, you, you get two asteroids heading at each other, there's going to be collateral damage. I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the, the precious thing, you should have seen these guys with machine guns stressing out that we're, we're going to hurt each other. <laughs> do we shoot one? Which one do we shoot? I don't know. Do, what do we do? I don't know. <laughs> it was great. Wow. What a, what that, that's quite a scene. That's, that, that's like HBO miniseries quality stuff right there. It really is. Yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah. So there's... So there you go, and you get stitched up. You're on the plane, and uh, yeah. that's your U- Ukraine experience. What was for that's people who didn't know? Forever. I was gonna, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say for people who didn't really know what was what was going on because the UFC, you know, had been a smash, made a lot of money uh, in those first yeah. few shows, but it was kind of it was it was already starting to hit those rough political waters. Other people are starting to defect, start set up other shows. Um, what was it like in the business at that point in time? Very, like, bike backbiting going on? You know what? I get a call from Bob Marowitz telling me not to go do this fight in Russia. Yeah. And I say to him, I said, Bob, are we talking retainer? Are we talking some sort of commitment? What are we talking here? You asking me a favor? I don't remember knowing you that long and didn't know I had, you had one coming. So what are we talking professionally now, Bob? And he was like, you might want to think twice about blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, what you just said to me, if I just recorded it, I could take you to, um, oh, if I was recording it, maybe I'm recording this, who knows? But if I did, I could take you to court and take everything you own. So if I was you, I'd play nice. And so I think that's probably where our bad blood started. That's probably why I imagine that. Other there thing. you go. But, you know, but, but I mean, he was asking things of people that were unfair. How can you not give me an opportunity to go experience Russia and make money because that's all I'm doing. I'm a fighter now. I had to make a choice career-wise. And he wasn't taking, there wasn't, they weren't, they wouldn't take care of anybody. So yeah, it wasn't going to happen. People went and did, there was no backstabbing. If families take care of each other, if he wanted us to be a family, he would have took care of us like a family. Yeah. Yeah. You know, was that um, was that a decent payday out in, in, in Russia? Did that, was it one yeah, of those like, yeah. Or, yeah. I made more money. I made more money. I'll, like smaller shows than I did at the UFC, except for UFC 7. I'm mm-hmm. in the final. But, um, yeah, the UFC was, you know, they, they just, they didn't have a long view. Bob, no, Bob Marowitz did not have a long view. Mm-hmm. And and I yeah. would talk to them about it and try to be cool with them. And matter of fact, one of the nights, this was great, at UFC 6, sorry, but uh, Brian Johnson almost hit Marlon in the head with a champagne bottle because Marlon was talking shit about me behind my back. I could hear it, but I was playing it off, and I looked out of the corner of my eye, and dude, Brian's got a bottle backwards in his hand, and I'm like, oh boy. I'm over, but Brian, no, 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 he goes, that guy's a son of a bitch, and Brian's a loyal, a loyal friend, a, yeah. a fiercely loyal friend. He, he does not let people hurt or, 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 you know, his friends in any way. And it was, it was, I was proud to be his friend in that moment. <laughs> it was hard for me to stop him, but I had to do it for his own good. Like, I wanted him to do it because I wanted to see the action, but I didn't want him to ruin his career and, and, and get in trouble. So, yeah, well, let's, Brian let's, can't let's take that let, let's talk about Brian real quick here while we have the chance, Paul. It, yeah, obviously, yeah. Um, he had a very um, – it was a really heart-wrenching moment for a lot of fans of the sport at that time when he suffered a stroke and it was just abrupt yeah. and people yeah. weren't sure. How's he doing and, and, and how how did you, if at all, kind of help him through that, that well, medical challenge? I – you know, I wish <laughs> – that's, I'm glad you asked that, and I'm, I'm disappointed in myself that I was, I was so wrapped up in my own yeah. place. And that's why I said earlier, if you're in a bad position, it's, it's great to help others because you can shake off your own lament, you know, your own, your own haze. And I think that if I, if I would have done a little, tried to do a little bit more of that, I may not have gone so long and so dark with where I was at. So I like that you bring that up. I wish I would have. Yeah, kind of could have helped more. 
um, or you know, would have helped him more. I could have, but just would have helped him more. Um, but what I'd like to say about Brian is that he had, I think that stroke was an, was, and this is going to sound weird, but it was an opportunity for him to be the man that he is. He's always mm-hmm. been. But but the, what he faced and what he's made it through and how he's how well he's done it with such um, grace and 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 strength uh, is is testament to the people that that you know push themselves and and make take take risks and and have make sacrifices for the things in their lives sure. and you know that's. He, he's like I said, almost an inspiration. There's so many guys I think of that that have come up with some bad situations, and you know, it's just it's it's not what happens to you; it's, it's how you deal with it. And and you know, and maybe not always during, for my case, but like, like afterward, you know. <laughs> um, sure, but, sure, sure. You know, it, how's it, he it, doing it, now? When's the last time you talked to him? He's in Arizona, and as a matter of fact, we were trying to get him to come out to the expo in. Um, in, in in Vegas, and he wasn't he didn't feel comfortable. Um, I guess he's had he. It, it, I guess with the situation, it gets kind of worse, and then and then other times not so worse. And but I've talked to him. Um, he's in Arizona. I'm almost positive he's going to be out with us with the Legends of the Cage at the uh, the Expo in in um, Syracuse on October third and fourth. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing him. I haven't seen him in a long time. He um, when we were in San Jose. He was out in the Delta area. He had a home in the Delta area, and um, it was really far from where I was. And and in, in my little weird space time there, I, I I'd lost my car, my license. I was really boiled down to a very small place in the world. And so, but that's no excuse. I should have found a way out there. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, so Brian Johnston, a name that you know you, you don't think you don't think about too often, but. Um hearing him come up a lot with you and remembering that you kind of came up in the game together and stuff I didn't even know about your time at AKA. It's, uh, you know, it's good to hear that, um, the, the feeling around him is still positive, you know, that he, that he hasn't taken any kind of real negative turn or anything like that. No, he, he dealt really well with a much more challenging situation than I had. I'll tell you what, he, you know, I wish I would have dealt with my situation half as well. If I would dealt with my situation a quarter as well as he dealt with a much more, serious situation, um, you know, I would have been okay. <laughs> but he's, like yeah. I said, he's, he's faced, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, I don't have, my back's hurt, and I, I have trouble getting around stuff, but he's really, really been limited. And the frustration I felt of, of not being able to be as active and not be able to do as many things as I used to do, I mean, come on, I can't complain. I mean, it's, you know, you know it's, it's yeah. when I think about that, it's, you know, and I, the best I can draw from it, and it's true, is that he's faced it like a champion. He said he's made the most of what he has, and, and he keeps doing it, and that's a uh, motivation for, you know, some of us are a little slower, you know, realizers. <laughs> On the uptake, yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned that kind of friction with UFC, SCG, uh, but they still had you back uh, for Ultimate Ultimate 96. This was your last UFC fight, and it was a war against Chemo, a nine-minute battle. Uh, and uh, tell me a little bit about the run-up. Were you originally scheduled to fight here, or were you like a replacement? Oh uh, yeah, here's here's the phone. But actually, there was the the there was one more UFC. Actually, I fought in the um, the, the battle of the uh, David and Goliath. I did that one. Too. Yeah, you fought Joe Moreira. Yes. Right. 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 But but back to 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 Ultimate Ultimate. After UFC 7, um, <clears throat> it was stated very clearly on the posters that it was the best of the best tournaments, either runners-up or champions would be in the tournament. And I got wind that they were putting Keith Hackney in. Mm. Nothing against Keith Hackney, personally. Great guy. Great competitor. But not a runner-up or champion of a UFC. Right. And I took issue. And this, at this point, I hadn't, they hadn't told me yet that, or Marlitz hadn't revealed yet that he was harboring this this animosity towards me because of the UFC 7 couldn't losing after money. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I didn't realize that my invitation wasn't in the mail because of that. And if I would have, I would have sued them because I was going to sue them. I, I called them and I said, well, uh, I, have, there's a little, I have a little point of order to discuss with your lawyers. 
And they're like, oh, yes. So, well, you know, I mean, being that you've advertised that this is a United of Champions and or runner-ups and you have a non in there and I'm a mm. current runner-up, um, I believe you'd be in breach of a unofficial contract or actually the rules that you've stated, which would dictate some sort of uh, – um, unfair, you know, trade practice. I mean, I can go down the list of things that 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 the laws are broken, you know. Mm-hmm. And they were now, like, we oh, talk, oh. just to be clear here, Paul, sorry yeah. to interrupt, just to be clear, are we talking about yeah. Ultimate Ultimate 95 where you fought Severn or are we talking about 96 chemo? We're talking about no, 95. No, no, 95. Right? This is, yeah, okay, this is 95. Yeah. Continue, continue. All right, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, that was after Mark Overloss. Yes. And, yeah, that was, that was, um, yeah, I was expecting to go. I mean, I was, I was, that, I was so excited, you know, and I was, you know, like, and I find this out, and I didn't know at the time that Marowitz was harboring this this delusion that I'd somehow master planned my way in by faking being sick. So, oh God, did I say that? Oh, oops. Um, but there it, is. Uh, there it is. So I'm not I'm not in there, and I'm supposed to be. So I go, I talk, I started, I, I start with the attorneys because those are who you scare first, because it's their job to scare people. When you scare them, people get the point. So. I start breaking down all the laws that they've, they've, they've infractions that they've occurred and, and how I'm going to follow up on it because I'll probably make more money suing them than I ever will fighting for them. Hmm. And I think at that point they saw I was serious and they start back wheeling. Well, they always did. I mean, because I, I did it. They just were, they were trying things that were wrong. Just because you write something in a contract doesn't make it legal. You can say, hmm. I, Paul Burns, let you kill me here for $5,000. It's still murder. So you can't break the law in the contract. So yeah. basically saying that they were like, they were breaking the law and they started trying to make a deal with me. And the thing that was, we'll make you the alternate, the only alternate you'll be in it. So, uh, there's no, there's, there's, if you call me an alternate, I'm definitely suing because that lowers my status, you know, because I'm not, you know. So they made me this thing called the eighth man and they gave me a bunch of money to satiate me. And I was at the show, and I had, you know, free everything. And I couldn't imagine in a million years anybody would drop out of a tournament for $150,000. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know I wouldn't. I mean, I know I wouldn't. So I'm at this thing, and I'm, I'm just, I didn't train the way I should have trained. I didn't have the right attitude. I mean, I was, I was young. I didn't get how life can just, you know, boom. So the morning of the fight, I get a knock at my door. It's, it's, you know, Davies and McLaren, because Marowitz is just beside himself. He hates me so much. He was like, you can't get rid of me. Um, I'm like, the, I'm like, so the big Panther. You just can't kill me. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> Seriously. You have the twitch and everything. Uh, but, um, so they're, they're like, Hey, you're in, you're in. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And honestly, because I'd been around Brian and because I'd been around Javier, who were professionals, you know how to do things the right way, I realized I should not do this. This is not the best thing for me representing myself because I don't, I'm not ready. But because I'm the polar bear, I did it. <laughs> I said, okay, let's do it. So I had Dan in the first round, and he just, you know, I, I threw a kick. I don't throw kicks. I'm not a kicker. And so I throw this long kick, and he just gets around me, gets me in the chokehold, and he's like, come on, Paul, I don't want to choke you out. And I'm like, you're going to have to, bro. I don't tap out. And so we're having this cross talk, and John's like, you guys, just do something. And so, you know, Dan finally chokes me out, and I come to, and, you know, it looks like he won the whole tournament, you know, because, I mean, if you're going to go out, go out against the guy who won it. So uh, that, was a, that was a poor showing. I should have done better. It's my own fault, not not the UFC's. I should have been prepared no matter what. But I also should have just been in the damn tournament. You sure? I mean, so, so you got brought to the building. You got brought to the building after that kind of legal showdown, as kind of like you said, this this eighth man, this like bench yeah. rider kind of guy. Um, so who was whose place did you take? Why did they suddenly have an opening? Pa- Patrick Smith had some medical issue. I'm not, I'm okay. not sure what it was. It. Yeah. yeah. So it was Smith. So you're in. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't. Man, I wish I would have trained for that. <laughs> so much money. <laughs> I can hear it. I can hear it in your voice. So then you fight uh, Joe Marrera, and you beat him at UFC 8. Uh, um, yeah, and the, yeah. Yeah, anything on that? Before I don't want to just blow yeah. past oh, no, no, that fight, Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. Yeah, I love the Puerto Rican people. They're passionate people. But they like to throw ice. And, <laughs> and so I win my fight with Joe. And uh, Joe wasn't – Joe, like a lot of – 
traditional jiu-jitsu practitioners. He's world class. He's a, he's an amazing athlete, an amazing jiu-jitsu practitioner. But I don't think he gets hit much. And yeah. I threw that one big left, and literally the picture of it, his head hits the ground. He's still standing, but his head hits the ground. He bounces back up, and he looks at me wide-eyed like, no way. <laughs> he starts yeah. backpedaling real time. And so we're getting the booze and everything, so I do a little bit of showmanship and draw the line. But the bottom line is he is a great jiu-jitsu guy, great. But, you know, being hit is different than being, you know, locks and all those stuff. But um, so I'm walking backstage, and this ice is being thrown and all this stuff, and I slip in an ice on an ice cube. And my ankle swells up so big, it looks like I've got elephantitis of the ankle. Hmm. And but I'm not gonna. I'm not. I'm still gonna fight. I was gonna fight off my back, but the doctor comes in from the UFC with, with Marlitz right behind him with this big cheese smile on his face, and the doctor says, "Oh, you can't fight with that ankle." And I'm. I'd like to see in the contract where it says I cannot go back with an injury because there's precedent and said fighters come back with injuries to fight. It's up to the. It's the fighter's prerogative. And he's like, "This is my medical." Da, 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 da. Somehow I let them talk me out of it. Like we had an argument over it, and right. I was right. I mean, everybody gets hurt in 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 a fight, and you just work with it. So I would have hopped out on one foot, dropped into the into the guard, you know, into the you know, into the guard position, and done like you know, like like the like the one Gracie did against um um uh, Olag, you know, and he mm-hmm. was successful. He knocked Olag out. So I mean. It wasn't. It wasn't a plan that was not workable. It was a workable plan, but they they, they just denied me my right to fight. And Marwitz was looking for that, and that wasn't my last UFC. That was the last one. And you know, not that I couldn't have done more, but I, you know, that's just before they banned it. And right, yeah, and the, the whole economics yeah. changed, and everything it, was different. Right. After that, you did the Ukraine show. You fought uh, Shinji Katasi in New Japan, and then you had your final UFC fight, Ultimate Ultimate ninety six, Chemo Leopoldo. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. And, uh, I almost forgot. That. I almost, oh my god, I almost forgot. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was kind of a it was a pretty clean break there for a minute, but I guess you yeah. you filled in for Shamrock, right? Or right. Coleman, right. Coleman, Coleman, oh, Coleman, Coleman. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, wow, that's when that one's so that was so. Um, yeah, that was. Yeah. And you know something? It's, what's sad about that is that's when I really got to hang out with Gary for the first time. We hang, we hung out and had a really good time, and he's got no recollection of that. And I'm just, right. it's, it's a bummer, you know. But but yeah, so so fighting chemo, I was really big. I was like 420 pounds or 430 pounds. I got so big, I was lifting wow. and just 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 just. I was into power for some reason. I just got on this power kick, and but what I realized is. Every punch I threw, I got tireder and tighter. All that mass takes oxygen and energy. So, you know, it's really better to be an efficient fighter than a, than a large fighter. But, mm-hmm. but, yeah, I hit him and hit him and hit him. He was bleeding from his eyes. Yep. Have you ever seen that? Did you see that fight? Yes. He had the, the blood trickling there, yeah. He's bleeding out of his eyes, and they could feel the punches through the octagon out into the stands. They mentioned that on the thing. And I've never hit somebody so hard in my life. And he's just not, he's like I wasn't even knocking at the door. And eventually, he's pretty wore out too. And I just gasped because Big John's staying on me like, if you, if you, you know something, I'm going to break you, I'm going to break you. So I just go, boom, boom, until I just gasped. I gasped out. It looks like he, it kind of looks like he does a, like a, like a, a gee choke on me, but I'm wearing a t-shirt. Yeah, like so he uses no the shirt, yeah. Yeah, well, I was, I, I hit him until I gassed out. Yeah. I literally had no wind left. And he won, he won, he won, he won, so no way around it, he won. And um, I wasn't knocked out, I was, I had no wind left, I swear. Um, but he went to, he had to go to the, he had to go to the, uh, to the hospital in an ambulance, he was so messed up. Yeah, like, yeah that was a real battle. That was a just yeah. I'm never like I said, never hit anybody that hard, and so he he can't come for the second round, and they put the alternate in, and I, I was like, why, why would an I mean I th- I thought I should go in before the alternate because I was still ready to go, but like you know it was just technically they were right, but but I got a little argument with Marwitz like usual, it's our usual motive. <laughs> motive yeah, 
This is becoming a theme. Yes, yes. It really is. It really is. I mean, literally, we were the Pink Panther. He was. He was. He was the, he was the head inspector, and I was like Clouseau, just fumbling <laughs> through, being successful, not knowing how he's doing it. Wow. Everybody, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> So um, before we continue on the MMA side, this is 96, and I do want to take a quick detour because as a pro wrestling fan, I was fascinated by your match against Taz in ECW, yeah. Hardcore Heaven, Philadelphia. How the yeah. hell did that come together? Well, um, Paul Heyman, 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 yeah, Heyman, 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 yep. Came, oh, yeah. He got a hold of me and was like, hey, man, you want to make some extra money? And God, I needed it, okay? Like, you know, yeah. I was just, just scraping by and he's like, come on out, just, you know, throw our guys around. And, you know, I said, I can't lose. I can't lose to a pro. I can't lose in pro wrestling. You know this, right? He's like, yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course. So I get out there. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, the hook. And um, <laughs> the hook was, yeah, yeah, yeah. The sink was, the, was, was Missy Hyatt when she was in her prime, okay? Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah, yeah, looking forward to that part of the story. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah so, so I get out there and, and almost instantaneously, Actually, I don't. I forget the girl's name because I didn't really get to hang out with her. But the little Asian girl came up to me. I forget what girl she was. What her name was. But I never. Really Kimona Wanalea. Yeah, Kimona Wanalea rolls up on me and she puts her hand around me and goes, "Hey, I'm your friend." I'm like, "Really?" You know, I was like, "Wow." I mean, she came up to my knees about it, right, and yeah. I'm just my imagination's going places it really shouldn't go. So, but then out of nowhere comes Missy Hyatt, and she come walks up, puts her hand on Kimono's face, just push, and <laughs> says, Kimono, like, gone, right? And she goes, no, I'm your friend. I'm like, okay, six foot blonde, gigantic eyes. Um, yeah, well, sir. You know, and um, yeah, we made friends right there, and yeah, they're good, good buddies. Uh, so that was, the, that was the sink of the hook. Um, and I did a bunch of shows. I did a bunch of little shows out in the middle of nowhere and had a good time. And, and, but then the Taz thing came up. And this was, on, in, his, in, in Paul's mind, the, the time for him to ask for the favor. Yeah. And I'd been clear, you know, you, I can't lose to a pro wrestler, you know, like it's not going to happen. And uh, to make a long story short, we're in a, in a locker room. He's got his guys all around me, and they don't realize that he's about to do this. He says, you know, Paul, you're going to do this. <laughs> there was an inflection of, of, of um, how would you say it? Aggression. Like a a voice. Men aggression. menacing kind of. Yeah, sort of, a, sort of an aggressive sort of like tone, like he had a pair mm -hmm. that he was going to use. And I look up my guy, just just perplexed, perplexed, and he and he's looking around at the out his guys. I'm like, oh really? This is a they're gonna jump me thing? And so I look out to his guys, and his guys are great guys, Blue Nini, all of them. They're all cool dudes who wanted nothing to do with Paul's <laughs> illusion. Okay, so as I look out, and I'm not even expecting this. They just look down, look down, look down. Every eyes that I look at, they look down, and that's the universal sign of. We don't know what the hell he's talking about, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I come back to his eyes, and I sit down very, very gravity. I just let gravity take me to the chair. almost blew the chair out. And I'm all, so now do you understand where we are? Did you just fucking threaten me? And before I knew, the whole half rock was empty. <laughs> all those guys were gone. They just, boom, disappeared. All the stuff was still there, but it was me and Paul. And so we had a we had a we had to come to an understanding. He had to come to an understanding because he he made a major 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 mistake of reality. And you have got to I just heard about what McMahon did to to um, Owen Hart mm -hmm. and to Brett. Yeah, Brett, no Owen. He killed Owen. Brett Brett was his well, brother, right? Right, that well, was okay. up. Well, Owen, 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 Owen died, but Owen, Owen died. Dropped, th he died yeah, three Owen years got after dropped off the top dead. of the stadium by yeah. because McMahon said, "If you don't do this stunt you've never done before with this equipment that's subpar, you'll never work for this business again, and your family's going to starve to death." So Owen Hart did something he should not have done. He knew he shouldn't have done it. He wasn't going to do it, but under threat for his family's well-being, I believe they killed him. I believe they murdered him. I took that very, I did not like that. As a matter of fact, I wanted to yeah. be a pro wrestler before I wanted to be a fighter, but I couldn't make the right connections. And so 
when I saw that on TV and that, the news report, I realized I can never pro wrestle for real. Like, because if, if I was in his shoes, it would have been McMahon hanging from that wire by his yeah, neck. Yeah. yeah. Cause you know what? Yeah. That's just, that's, so when I'm, when, when you know, where I'm having a discussion with Paul, that's in my head. And I'm thinking, wow, how many guys have been hurt? And now I know what's been, I consider it murder. I don't mince words about it. Well, I got I got to say Paul just just quickly. I mean, this you're having this conversation with Heyman in 96. Owen Hart was killed in 99. So I, I doubt was that was in, No way. Yeah, wait. Not, okay, I'm getting Okay. I can't, I was pissed for some reason though. <laughs> sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> I believe that. I, you, you know, you're probably right. I'm like okay, my memory is kind of linearly challenged. Yep, yep, yep. But I was super pissed. I know that. And I know I can't pull up because of that thing too. So I pull like, you know, hey, that's my bad. Totally. Like I'll double check it though. But I believe, I believe it. Paul has to come off this insistence that somehow he can intimidate you into losing to Taz, right? No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and nobody but Paul was like down with this thing. And so I, I'm like, I, I got pissed. I think I was looking for a reason to be so pissed, but I got really pissed. And the conversation was a little bit more than a conversation. And we basically came to an agreement that was, I would do a cheat win for him. He paid me a lot. He paid me a lot of money, and um, wasn't upset about our discussion. And um, it, it worked out that way. And but but you know what I really pulled out of it though was I was proud of that that work because I sold Taz. I mean I made it look like he could roll with me, and he. Did. When he we were doing the we were doing and we didn't even, we didn't even do any brush up before we didn't do any practice no trial runs or nothing and that was just all familiarity which we had none of but, but moving and, and he's he's I mean he's he's awesome too his his chops were amazing and and I'm proud of it because I, I mean it, it, it looked good didn't it. It looked good, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, yeah, it did, especially especially at the time when you know wrestling fans weren't really plugged into what, an, by and large, weren't really plugged into what a real fight looked like. Right, right, right. We were doing the lock, the hammer lock things, and the, the, the switching positions and rolling out, and you know, I, that that was fun. That was a lot of fun, seriously. And then, um, then uh, his his partner uh, Sabu, I guess, was Sabu. I think it was Saturn. Uh, Perry Saturn. 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 Okay, see, from I'm the, yeah. from the Eliminators. He came off the top and drop kicked you in the back of the head when the ref was distracted. Right, right, exactly. And that that was that was yeah, that and that's that works for me. I mean, a cheat that's not you know what I mean that that that's explainable, right? For the people right. who are confused, for you know. So yeah, so it, it worked out. I made good money, and um, I really feel like I have a piece of history with with pro wrestling. Not only that, I trained in the in the in the sportatorium in Texas with a couple mm -hmm. of guys. That was, that's that's a piece of history there, and mm -hmm. um, me and Missy Hyatt, we were we were hanging out for some time, and that was fun. That was fun, and she's definitely a piece of of the history. That's for sure. Um, and then I, you know, <laughs> I actually got got into I got to get in and, and to actually do the thing. And like I said, my original goal was to pro wrestle, and I could never make the connections from the mid the the, the Bay Area. Yeah, sure, and that, that is a business that very much thrives on, on connections. i got to ask you, Paul, you may be aware, it's even in your Wikipedia page, there's a story told about that night wherein you proposition one Missy Hyatt, and she refuses, and you flip out and tear up the locker room. What, what's up there? What, what happened? There's, there's several happen? versions. There's several versions of that story. A yeah. locker room did get tore up. Um, in her book, she, if you read her book, she says that I did the work for a blowjob. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's many different versions of it. Um, the best version for fun is Missy's. Um, the real version, I believe, was mine. But like I said, my memory does kind of flip sometimes. <laughs> but, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. But 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 the, as far as you know, as far as me and her dated for you know the whole time. Every time I came out, which was a bunch, we were dating. So mm -hmm. when people date, they you know. There's natural human things that happen. I don't want to be. I don't want to be. You sure, know, sure. I've had yeah, some ex-girlfriends. I've had some ex-girlfriends who, who took who took uh, a bad uh, a bad view on what Missy wrote. But like all professionals, I look at any press as good press. You know, so yeah, and it's sure. kind of a yep. you know, and yeah, and yeah. She she was great. She was cool. You know, she broke she broke up with me. This was great. She just, this was the best breakup I ever had in my entire life. I was getting too much attention. 
we'd be in downtown New York. She lived on the upper 75th Street. And we'd be walking around, and people would like, hey, polar bear, hey, polar bear. And she would get so red. And I'm like, what's wrong? That's my attention you're stealing. And she meant it. Wow. <laughs> and then so she's like, honey, we can be friends. We can do the thing. But you know what? I cannot be dating a man who gets more attention than I do. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's cool. I, it was, it was, I really actually respect it. She, she taught me a lot about professionalism. She taught me a lot about – she did an um, autograph signing, with, you know, doing pictures of one of those, you know, with a bunch of athletes doing them. And I went out to visit her. It was in the Bay Area, and a bunch of people wanted to do – get an autograph from me, too. And – she, she said, okay, you can have, well, I'll take half the money of this and this and this and this. She broke it down and said, okay, hey, whatever, it's cool. And, but then she, taught, she did, she, she explained to me later how I should approach doing that in the future and the uh -huh. professional side of it is. And she, she's an amazing woman. She's pretty cool. Well, that's cool. Yeah. See, I, I thought that would be a sore spot, but it sounds like you don't have hard feelings towards her. No, I don't. It takes a lot to give me hard feelings, bro. Like, I'm, 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 I can take a moment and take and try to look from somebody's perspective what they're doing. And if it makes sense, I'm cool with it, but if it makes no sense, then I'll get like, like Tank. I'd do. I'd want to do another fight just so I get another shot at it. Do I hate yep. him? No. I feel sorry for him. Any bully is a sad case, you know. And when a bully hits you with their best stuff, they don't want it anymore afterward because he wouldn't rematch with me. <laughs> so you know, I'm not, hate hate so hates a weapon we use on ourselves. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so we'll leave, we'll leave that that part of the story at that. That the story she tells is the most entertaining one about that night. It doesn't sound like you're refuting it directly, but you, it, there's another version perhaps where you don't come off as so uh, so so forward. No, I you know, I mean I don't know how you so forward with my girlfriend at this time, but yeah, I mean, right. I, it's, you know, it's 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 all good. There was a locker room that was messed up. There was a there was a request that was uh, abnormal. Okay. And there was um, later that night. I think there might have been a blowjob, but I'm not sure who got it. But there definitely was one somewhere. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. I, I, I date I date other women, so you know I can't I can't get all creepy about it. I know I'm gonna pay for it anyway, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. So um, so then after the chemo fight at Ultimate Ultimate '96, your final UFC fight, you you journey yeah. to Brazil um, yeah. and you compete at the World Valley Tudo Championship three, and we get our first glimpse of the Smashing Machine Mark Kerr uh, in a mixed yeah. martial arts fight or you no holds barred fight. Tell me about January 1997, a fight where Mark Kerr really established you know what what he was all about, and uh, you were in there and you were taking what he had to bring. Yeah, I did. Um, once again, it's that that you know I'm never going to quit thing, and and you know it was it was. It was it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. It was it wasn't good. And and he he I mean, he pounded me. I was I was, I was hamburger afterward. And um, but the cool thing was that we were in Brazil. We were in I think it was Sao Paulo. Was Sao Paulo, right? Um, I think so. And the yeah the the fans after I get up after an immense amount of being pounded and all I'm doing is like I'm throwing this fist out trying to reach him, like find where he is and he's just dropping knees, dropping punches, dropping knees. I'm just like this hand's going, uh, I'm trying to hit something. And kind of uh, trembling cover your trembling face and, and fight at the but, same time. But, yeah, exactly, exactly. But you know, no quit. No quit. It wasn't yeah. a tap, it was it was an attempt at a swing. <laughs> but um but as we're standing there and I'm bleeding and I'm just can barely see out of my blood filled eyes I start hearing they're chanting my name, Polar Bear. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what, what the hell? And Kerr's like, hey, didn't I just beat your ass? So I was like, yeah, yeah, you pretty much did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Brazilians were so into the fact that I wouldn't tap. Mm -hmm. I got out of the ring. They're all patting me on the back. Like, when you get technique, you'll destroy him. You've got heart. Like, it was awesome. I never felt so great after being so manhandled. There's no yeah. not to make chops about it. But they didn't. They made the point that, that I'm most proud of is that I showed no sign of, of my will bending. And they appreciated that in a big way. And, I'm, you know, it's, it, was, it was a... I love Brazil. I love Brazilian people. They're passionate people. They, 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 if you're friends and your family, they'll do anything for you. And, and, and they just have a, such a passion about life and, and such loyalty to their friends and loyalty to the good things in life. Um, I love going to Brazil every time I want. I want to I want sure. to. Yeah, yeah. This was awesome. That was a fight. It, it was sort of one of the last fights like it 
as no holds barred fighting evolved, guys got more proficient in general, and you saw right. you know guys right. much more three dimensional skill sets f fighting. And where one of the last fights where I remember where it was like, what must it be like besides horrifying to be a guy on the bottom in a position like this? You know, it's just I I, I always wanted to ask you what I, you know. It's funny you say horrifying. You say that that I I'm missing the. And not for good reasons, okay? For bad reasons, I'm missing the ability to be concerned for my own welfare. Yeah, that must be it. Because I don't know how you're not just like absolutely yeah. paralyzed with fear when you realize how strong this guy is and how sh how good he is at, at ground and pound. Yeah, he got position, he had that technique, and he had that yep. strength. And, yep. You know, and I just didn't, I wasn't, I didn't have the skill set for him, but I, but I was developing it. It was I was getting there, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was just, I was behind everybody, man. I was, I was like years and years and years behind everybody, but I was still making my ground. And every step I took was worth a ton because of my strength and my, that toughness. But yeah, he, it was, it sucked. But I can honestly tell you, there was n the fear is gone the moment the bell rings. Wow. All fear is gone, and that's not smart. <laughs> I don't recommend that to anybody out there, but it's just who I am. It's just how I was brought up, and it's just how I process pressure and, and those kind of things. So, yeah, I was never even once thinking about tapping. It just, or, or even, even like I was being hurt. All I was trying to think of was ways to get out, try to scoot out behind. Try to, but it was, it was like, damn, I'm all out of things to do here. This, this is just kind of horrible. And like, I'm thinking so much, I think I'm not feeling it. Right. I like, understand. it's not yeah. registering. Like, I, I remember the pain of my breath and my chest because I wasn't as winded as I, I didn't have a wind I should have had because I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> you know? But yeah. that pain I remember, but I never remember being struck except for baby Marco Huas. And it wasn't the pain. It was the energy I got from the pain to get my, my energy back up because I was sick with Marco Huas. But, like, literally the pain was a... Uh, I guess I disassociate they call it, and I would disassociate with it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, did you did you have a way that you thought you were going to attack Mark Kerr in your mind before he took you down, like before the bell sounded? Did you have an idea? I had no idea who Mark Kerr was until yep. I somebody told me he was an Olympic gold, uh, like wrestler, like silver gold medalist, and the picture I'd seen in him before, like during wrestling, looked nothing like like the guy that was across from me. I mean, the guy across from me looked. Like he was, I don't know, huge. I mean, he was gargantuan. Gargantuan, and I mean, just cut and just huge. And just there was muscles on muscles over muscles. There's muscles holding up muscles, you know. Yep. Um, and I was just like, wow. Okay, this is. I'm just, <laughs> you know, like, you know what I was gonna do? You know, like I knew the rest one. I was like, well, let's just, you know, let's just. I was kind of tripping out a little bit, but but you know, like I said, I just do it. I just do it. So, yeah, he. I knew he was a world class athlete, and I knew he was, um, um, you know, a, a handful. And then I, you know, I think. Well, you know, I fought in Amsterdam, right? I fought Dick Virig. I'm trying so to remember that's your that. last fight, right? Um, I the think actually record is your last fight. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, see, there's a bunch of fights that they don't have. Like when I fought with Kingdom. I fought with, mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of guys in Japan that are not on my record. Like, there's a bunch of things that, that I did. That, I was even a referee. Um, but, um, so that, yeah, but when I fought Virig, and I'm not sure, I think that was, Virig was after, yeah, Virig was after Kerr. And I it dropped was, it was a bunch of weight. 98. Yeah, I dropped a bunch of weight, and I was, and I, I fought Barreto in Brazil right before. Yep. In, uh, in another Valley Tudo. Um, yeah. And he, he won. Well, he opened up. No, wait, wait, wait. No, that's a different one. I fought Nick Nutter in, mm -hmm. in the ad. I fought in Brazil three times. One was with Beretta, one was with Kerr, and one was with – I fought Nick Nutter. And the Nick Nutter one was right before I flew. I literally had the Nick Nutter fight, and seven days later I fought in Amsterdam. That's and right. Nick, yeah, Nick opened up my eye because they let him wrap his hands, and they didn't let me wrap mine. It's not Nick's fault. His promoter's doing. Nick's a great guy. Um but so I got my eye opened up, and they stopped the fight, made my money. Seven days later, I go from Brazil to Amsterdam, and I've got this big open open thing over my eye. And like, oh, you can't fight like that. Well, then pay me. I'm out of here <laughs> because I showed up. The contract says I show up. So so they're like, okay, you can fight, but close that. I'm like, so I just put super glue in the holes and held it shut, and it sealed nicely. It sealed nicely. It worked really well. It stung like a son of a pistol. 
Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, but but the the thing about Virg's fight, he he really would have done a lot better if the fans and his promoter and his trainer weren't laughing at me. Hmm. Like right before the fight, I got this. I was standing, not facing it, but I I got this feeling, this weird feeling, I've been, like like really looked at more than usual. And so I turn around and they're laughing and pointing, and I'm like. <laughs> That was the wrong thing to do. Like, honestly, he probably, because the rules were like kickboxing rules. I, I was gloved. There was, like, it was basically kickboxing. They were calling it MMA. And Dick was, a, like, the, like, a, like a Northern European kickboxing champion. He's, he's amazing. He looks like Thor. Um, and, but when they laughed at me, I was like, <laughs> that just really pissed me off. And he, he was wailing on me pretty good, and I'm wailing on back, and, you know, I, but I just was angry. I was so angry. It just kept me going. And we just, we were like two battleships just firing into each other, just boom, 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 boom. And I think it was second or third round, I caught him with a big hook, and he went, like, a little bit through the ropes, and everybody in the place went dead silent. Like, they, nobody saw that coming. Even the referee didn't start counting right away. I'm like, you want to you you count this? He's like, oh, 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 you know. And afterward, his trainer came over, who's a world-class trainer. I mean, he's an amazing guy. He came up, he goes, the laugh, huh? It was, it was the laugh. I'm like, you got it. And, he, you know, he got, he knew it. He knew it. He came over with me. He's like, it's, we were laughing, huh? I'm like, yes, you did. He probably would have won. Yeah. That was your mistake. And so, um, yeah. is, that, is that your last fight? Do you remember that as your last fight? Uh, no, I think I had the Kingdom show in mm -hmm. Japan. I, I know I had three or four fights in Japan, three fights in Brazil. Um, like I said, I, I, my memory is a little bad, too, a little bit bad, too. Um, I've got my own issues with memory. Um, yeah. But I have my stuff written down so like, I can refresh myself. And sure. But I get, I get it out of order sometimes. Um, uh, so... Uh, but yeah, so it, it, it's around this time, uh, I presume that that you quit, uh, retire it from MMA. Uh, this is listed as your last fight. Um, and and why why did you step away? What, what did it come well, down I, to ultimately? I, well, actually, that was when that was McCain, I didn't retire. McC that the thing with McCain went down. Yeah, like I wasn't yeah. being invited right back to the UFCs, but I was planning on how fight in in uh, Turkey and in Australia, and I mean, I was just ready to tear up the world. I didn't care if I did any more UFCs because because Marowitz was just such a moron. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I mean, I didn't want it to go under either. And when that came, I'm not sure exactly what date that happened in, but it was right around that time. Or like it was close to that time. You know, I was preparing for these overseas things. And then I hear of the UFC getting banned, and I'm like, what? And I heard who did it, and I'm like, hey, that's, that's the guy who's the boxing commission guy. And I like, so I try, I try to help out the sport, you know, and Marowitz is just like, I think he got sick and tired of all the, the court things and all the things he yeah. doesn't go do shows. He just didn't want to fight. And, you know, it was his fault he had to do all those court things because they promoted it so negatively. They had to go with the uh, sensationalistic, you know, the meanest, roughest, toughest, most dangerous sport in the world. I mean, they were just opening the door to the problems. Okay, you know, you don't you don't promote something for it with a view of it having a future. You know, they were just like that. That each show they wanted to pump it up so much, even if it made it look like blood sport. You know, yeah. So yeah. he was he was his own end. You know, and yeah, that was. And then once once the UFC went under, all the shows overseas, the money went to nothing, or the, the shows went away. And um, I wasn't retired as much as I was lost. Like I, I wanted to go to work, but but the building disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, it, it, and I'm just whining right now because you know what I think of what what some of my friends have gone through, like Brian Johnson and 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 Gary Goodrich and stuff. And I, what I'm saying right now is really. Please don't hear me crying about it. Just this is just how no, no, I, no, no, no. you know, um, when it went, when it disappeared, I felt like it disappeared on me. Like the thing I went through my head is like, you're either supposed to get too old or injured or not be good enough. That's why you end a sport. The sport doesn't just disappear on you. And you know, like I just, I that was a hard transition for me. I felt, I just felt cheated. And I was just really getting good, and I, I dealt with it poorly. And, you know, in retrospect, it was just dumb. 
But in the time, I just loved what I was doing. I loved it so much. I loved it more than I had any idea. You know, it's all the traveling and then the, the com camaraderie with friends and just the whole lifestyle was just something that I'd come to, I guess, rely on. Or I don't know. It's kind of weird. Like, it was just, I just didn't deal with it very well. And then I, you know, I don't, you know, there was a, there was a, a lot of stuff. There was a lot of stuff. And I mean, honestly, I also got mono at the same time. Like in one month, I got oh, mono. I got my car taken. I got a good friend of mine committed suicide. One of my best friends. I I mean, literally, I could go down a list that just doesn't end. And I found myself completely empty of any sort of energy. And the mono was a big part of that. So there's this physical. There's a psychological. And it just set me up for, like, just to be kind of crippled mentally. Physically, yeah. there was a mentally, but not nothing like a stroke. I mean, I, I couldn't say I was, you know, physics, you know that kind of thing. But, but like incapacitated, but, yeah. I was incapacitated, both physically and, 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 and very much emotionally. And uh, So going through that, Paul, when would you say you made your break from the sport? When, when did you say to yourself... I'm, the sport not, broke for me. Yeah. The broke the sport, and when they brought it back, when it came back finally, I got excited again. But mm -hmm. the weight rule in this two sixty five yeah. in high school, I used to, have to suck weight to make two seventy five. I was wearing the bags, throwing up, spitting all the time just to make weight for high school two seventy five. I'm a full grown man now. <laughs> I got to make two sixty five. I. Probably could have, but I didn't know about how they drop that nowadays. Like I didn't know they had this right. they had really amazing weight loss stuff, and I just it just didn't I couldn't see it. And so it was kind of like a, one more kick to the to the groin about like tempting me for this thing I wanted so bad. So you know, so mm -hmm. that was kind of like you know I was like kind of bummed. So uh, yeah, but but like I said, it, it something that I learned from and grew through, and you know. <laughs> uh, I learned the hard way. I think they're a hard road to learn. So, so it's a really thrill cool learning. <laughs> so I can share later. Sure thing. Well, was there like a um, uh, like a job you took or a move you made that said, you know, this is the beginning of well, life after fighting? Well, I had to take the job with at the strip club as a bouncer because yep. at the time I had a situation with a three lettered part of your government. Well, I'm not going to say because just saying it, I feel like I'm bringing it in. Uh, I never want to feel it, and um, it was taking a big portion of my check, and I had to scrub on tips, so I was kind of indentured there. Not that it was a bad thing, other than my dad always worked at those damn things, and I said I never would. It's like one of those things mm -hmm. we say, oh, I'm never going to do this, and then fate says, yes, you are. So, you know, I mean, I mean but, yep. like, it could have been worse, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, it could have been so much worse. And, uh, you know, I just, but it was it was enough for me to kind of, I would say I was frozen a little bit. Basically, mm -hmm. became frozen in a state of uh, not sure what to do, not sure what I wanted to do, not sure what I. I just didn't deal. I kind of just froze myself and just that you know, I was working at a strip club for geez, I don't know how long, too long. And this this is in California, right? Yeah, 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 yep. Yeah. Yeah, I became almost synonymous with the place because I was yeah. you know working seven days a week and uh, it was. Uh, you could see there was a deterioration in me. Like I saw mm -hmm. a picture today from the, the net that, that was a picture of me with this other guy, and I look horrible. I mean, I look. I mean, it was on my. It's like my soul was being sucked out of me, and it was just by myself, though. I mean, I was just not moving on. I was just right. living. Well, here's the thing: all my fans, all the wonderful people who were like coming up to me, like, "Hey, when's your next fight? When's the next thing? When's the next that?" I never got a chance to step away from it and kind of, right. you know, like heal. You know, you had to like step away from the healing. The, the wonderful people that were trying to support me were actually kind of dragging me back to that space. So I could never get mm -hmm. away from it to just go um, over it, you know. So, and it's not their fault. You know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's how, you, how you process it. And I'm kind of going further than I'm ready to, but, you know, it was a bad time, you know. And there was a lot of word out about a lot of different things and, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say my piece when it's time, and and um, sure, sure. You know, it's it's uh, it was the MMA challenge. community was wondering 
what happened to yeah. Paul Marlins, and then there was these vagaries about you working in a in a club. So there yeah. it was, and it turned turns out you were going through something. There's a reason you weren't, uh, yeah. you know, high profile, so to speak. Yeah, there's definitely depression going on. There's definitely a lot of like emotional kind of. You know, people think that emotions are like, oh, if a guy's depressed or, or cries, he's weak. But you tell me anybody who's not won a championship and cried. Yeah, right, okay. right, exactly. Crying is a sign of passion and connection and, and, and power. Everybody's sitting there going, oh, you, don't, you know, men don't cry. Well, men that don't do anything don't cry because they don't put any skin in the game. If you have skin in the game, it's going to hurt. So, well put. you know, it's... <laughs> That's what I can say. So yeah, you know the, the 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 upside to passion about something is you get good at it, you submerge yourself in it, and you become part of it. But the downside is if you become too much of it, it's gone. Some of you is gone. 